Hello, my Kim 116 students. I hope you all are doing well and hopefully your weekend was good. So just a quick recap. Uh, I'm waiting on the graduate teaching assistant assistants to grade all your work and as soon as they get them. So I've given them the Thursday 5 p.m. as the deadline to turn in the grade for your work. So your grade for exam one should be up by then. Now remember, your exam two is this Friday. So that's the material that I'll be talking about. So anything I talk or I present during this from today until Wednesday will swap on your exam. Two. All right, so without further ado, let's start chapter 13. So before that, something that I have talked to you about every week before I start the slides. Again, remember, make sure you are using these metacognitive strategies to kind of help you through K116. And the amount of concepts that you have that you have to learn for the exam, that's a lot. And we're trying to squeeze so many concepts within a short period of time. So I highly suggest you start pressing the preview. Attending class, which means watching video. I know some of you are not doing it. Trust me, your knowledge take, you're not going to do it that good and even it's going to hamper your exam as well all right and definitely after you watch the video make sure you are reviewing after class it doesn't have to be right after you watch the video right maybe you take a break for one two hours or four five hours and come back and then review as to what you watched in the video and after that when you are studying for your exam these are some of the techniques that i said have so not by me i'm not just saying this all right there is literature out there that says that all these methods are effective ways of studying that will help you for your durable learning and finally make sure as you're studying randomly you're assessing yourself very very important All right, so without further ado, this is the concept that I was trying to kind of start last week, but couldn't. Uh, so here we go. We're going to start chapter 13, chemical equilibrium. So in this chapter, these are the concepts that we'll try to uh, understand. So it is conceptually a little bit challenging. The problems, I would say, aren't that bad, the problems that I'm going to work through. But again, I want you to think about these conceptually as well as I teach all these concepts, right? So something like Lee Sutterlier's, Sutterlier's principle, we're going to spend a lot of time on. So conceptually, I want you to take your time to internalize it as to what is happening, not only just try to memorize things. All right, so what is, chemical equilibrium. So let's say you have a reaction. Where this nitrogen dioxide is going to dinitrogen tetroxide. So what is the chemical equilibrium? Something that you might have learned in K115 is first thing, whenever we say that this system is in equilibrium, we will use these arrows. So that is keep that in mind, right? Other time, let's see if you have this reaction, right? Let's say HCl plus NaOH reacting to give you NaCl plus water. And we have been using these arrows. So this arrow tells you that, oh, all the reactants they react to get get to do the product but when i'm using when chemists use this arrow we are telling you that this reaction is in equilibrium so what does that mean all right so basically think about that right it's basically as soon as let's say you have this dinitrogen dioxide nitrogen dioxide you put in a beaker or tube all right and as soon as you put in the tube, 
over time it is going to start disappearing and n2o4 is going to start forming right then there's going to be a point where the rate of disappearance of no2 will be the same as the rate of formation of no2 all right and that point is called the equilibrium and at equilibrium the concentration remember the concentration of no2 or n2o4 does not change and that's what's the most important gist of equilibrium all right at the very beginning the concentration of no2 changes and then after a certain time both the concentration of no2 and n2o4 will remain constant even though there is this back and forth happen what i mean by that is what's this picture it's a really good picture right if you look at this picture that i just talked about right no2 going to n2o4 here it looks like the n2o4 was your reactant it doesn't matter but do you see how n2o4 starts with some concentration right then it is going to start disintegrating and then NO2 is going to start forming. Remember, this is the same graph that we've been using for kinetics. Concentration is in the y-axis, time is in the x-axis. But do you see at this point, the concentration of NO2 and N2O4 didn't change at all? And this is the point where, after which the concentration of NO2 and N2O4 didn't change, the forward reaction, the rate of the forward reaction is the same as the reverse reaction, and this part is called equilibrium. Right, so this is on the good example graph, right? You have a rate on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. So do you see how the rate increases as the concentration of n 2 increases? Right, and at this point where equilibrium has reached, the Kf is referring to the forward reaction. All right, so K reverse is referring to the reverse reaction. Because remember, we are looking at for this, we're looking at n 2 4 in equilibrium to 2NO2, where we said N2O4 right here is colorless. Whereas NO2 is brown in color. So if I go in this direction, I use the rate constant Kf to show that, oh, I'm talking about the rate in the forward reaction if i go in this direction i'm talking about the k reverse so there is rate constant in the reverse reaction again remember this is the same term that we talked about in the earlier chapter last week rate constant in the reverse reaction okay small k f is the rate constant in the forward reaction All right, so I hope this makes sense. And then not surprisingly, right? So this is the phenomenon that is observed in the reversible reactions. If the reaction wasn't reversible, right? That means N2O4 forming NO2, this system would not be considered to be in a chemical equilibrium. And this is on the example as to what I mean by the forward and the reverse reaction rate become the same. And this is a very, very good example, right? Analogy to kind of understand equilibrium. So if you look at these two jugglers, right? Once they have started juggling, right? Do you see at certain time, they always have two of these in their hands? Right. Do you see how the constant think about that as concentration became constant? Right. And then the rate at which they throw in the air is the same, right, for both of them. And this is one of the ways to kind of understand equilibrium as to what is happening in a reaction. All right. So basically at equilibrium, the forward rate of the reaction is the same as the reverse rate of the reaction right so the forward rate at which n2o4 is forming is the same as the reverse rate at which the 
N2FO is disintegrating back to NO2. But then, keep that in mind, the concentration at equilibrium is constant. Right, so this, this is what I mean, the concentration is constant. Right at that point, the concentration is constant. All right, so this is only example. Uh, something really important or if you're a biologist, this might be something that you have learned as to how the carbon dioxide is transported in the blood. All right, so basically carbon dioxide is transported in the blood from the tissues to the lungs in three ways. And one of the ways that you see in this picture is it dissolves in solution. All right, so carbon dioxide right here is dissolving in your bloodstream. All right, but the way to do that, right, is it has to go through this series of equilibrium steps. And you see how these arrows are also in equilibrium. And think about how important is equilibrium, right? It is literally keeping you alive. And don't worry about the reaction if you want. This is basically carbon dioxide reaction with water forming carbonic acid. So H2CO3 is the same acid which you have in carbon dioxide, right? So it's in your can of Coke. If you have a can of Coke, you have this Coke, right? With water and sugar and everything. Then the carbon dioxide is dissolved in there, right? So when carbon dioxide is dissolved in there, this is the reaction that happens. Carbon dioxide and water is in equilibrium with carbon dioxide, All right? And then, sorry, it's in equilibrium with carbonic acid. This right here is called carbonic acid. And then the carbonic acid can again be in equilibrium with hydrogen carbonate anion and H plus. Right, you need to know the reaction. I was trying to explain the species that take part as to how carbon dioxide is transported in the blood from the tissue to the lungs and how chemical equilibrium is the important concept that drives this process. All right, so now the first term that we're gonna learn for the equilibrium, we're gonna learn lots of uh, concepts, rather abstract concepts, right? And lots of mathematical abstract concepts, but I'll try to like tone it down as try to make it in the easiest form as possible so it's digestible to you all, all right? So Q, first thing, term, the reaction quotient Q and what it means. All it, te it tells you is how much of the relative amounts of the products and reactants are present during a reaction at a particular point of time. Keep something in mind, all right? Whenever I'm talking about the reaction quotient, I am not talking about the reaction is at equilibrium. It can be, but then again, it is just can be at any particular point in time, all right? So what I mean by that is, let's say in this reaction, it could have been, if I wanted to calculate Q right here, right? I could have done it. I will get a value, but let's see if I calculate the Q here, now that Q becomes something else. We'll talk about that later. After the equilibrium concentration of NO2 and N2O4 reached here, but I can definitely calculate Q at this point or even at these points, whenever the equilibrium hasn't reached. But again, what it tells you is basically nothing fancy, but just the relative amounts of your reactants and products. And the way it does it, is by this formula. Again, this formula isn't that bad at all. Let's try to break it down in the layman's term possible, right? So basically, what it tells you, remember, is first, again, do not get confused with this formula, right? So this formula right here that, I, that you see right here, it's 
is the same as this all this words that you see so basically qc to measure the relief amount of products and reactants what it does is it takes the ratio of the product concentrations right so do you see how this ns3 in this reaction ns3 is my product right so it takes the product of the product concentration but since ns3 is the only one product that's why i only have ns3 to the reactant concentrations right so this is the ratio divided by the ratio to the reactant concentration do you see how my n2 and h2 they're in my reactant all right that's what it means that's all right so if you think about this right let's just think about remember about the to the exponent power yet we'll get to that right but if you just think about mathematically all right so basically if i increase the concentration of ns3 what's going to happen to qc not surprising the qc will go up as well so basically what qc tells me is if i have a very very large number let's see if i do the math and if i got a thousand number let's say right and that kind of tells you that oh that means since that's a very, very big number that means ns3 has to be in much more excess than this n2 and h2 right if you think about this thousand the concentration of ns3 is way higher than the concentration of n2 and h2 all right all right now what are those powers what those powers are it says with each concentrations raised to the power equal to the coefficients in a balanced chemical equation so remember coefficients are literally the numbers in front of the reactants and the products right which just tells you that one mole of nitrogen reacts with three moles of hydrogen to give you two moles of ammonia and then you can even think about one molecule of n2 reacts with three molecules of n2 to two moles of ns3 these are relative terms right so basically all you're going to do is you're going to take that coefficient and they'll be raised to the power right for each of them since ns3 there was a question of two in front of ammonia that's why i put a power of two there was a question of one in front of n2 that's why n to the power one is n2 that's why i just leave that one alone i don't have to put that so that one finally if you look at h2 this is a question of h2 in front of a three in front of h2 that's why this number three so that is q that's it and this is how you write down the formula for q or this is how you set up the equation for q and something that you should have noticed right is a couple of things i use the term qc in the next slide i'm going to use the term qp what's the difference so this subscript c talking about the concentration whenever i talk about p i'm talking about the pressure all right that's why the term concentration is here. So keep that in mind. And that's why this bracket, right? In chemistry, anything, if you have a compound and put that in the bracket, this NH3, it's understood that you are talking about the concentration of ammonia in the reaction. Okay, I hope the C and the P subscript makes sense. All right, and this is what I mean by QP. Now, instead of concentration, if you're talking about the partial pressure rather than the concentration then that becomes the reaction quotient and again the concept is the same all reaction quotient tells you is the relative amounts of the product and reactants at a particular point in time that's it nothing fancy now since we're talking about partial pressure we use the term like PV equals to NRT. You know how this P, we have been using this to denote P, and that's what we're going to use to write down the reaction quotient P, QP. This is my reaction again, right? So let's see, instead of calculating or collecting the data for concentration, if the chemist collected the partial pressure, all right, which is P. So we can literally just change the concentration term 
with the partial pressure term. That's it. So that's why the pressure of NS3 is in the numerator and the since it's the product and the pressure of nitrogen and hydrogen is in the denominator. And do not forget the power, right? The coefficients do go to the power. This is one for this and then two for NH3. But do you see how this similar this is? QC is talking about the concentration, whereas QP is talking about the partial pressure. That's what we're trying to say. All right, so that means your first knowledge take one. So let's say you run this reaction in a chemistry lab where you have methane gas reacting with oxygen gas to give you carbon dioxide and water gas, these are all gas. So you have to write down the reaction question QP for this reaction, not QC. Keep that in mind. QP for this reaction. Right. So something that might throw you off a little bit here is in my earlier reactions, I only had one product. What would you do if you had two products? Not to worry. So let's see if this was my reaction. A plus B giving you C plus D. Right. So let's assume my coefficient was only two in front of C and nothing else. You have to write down the QP again. Like my formula told me, it says, sorry, the ratio of the partial pressure of products multiplied together. That means I'm going to do my QP is going to be partial pressure of C, P stands for partial pressure of C, times partial pressure of D. So that's what it says, I multiply together. Divided by partial pressure of A, times partial pressure of B. Am I done? No, because it does say with each partial pressure raised to the power equal to the coefficient. Now the only coefficient that I'm interested in is C, which has coefficient of two, and it's raised to the power of two, and that's it. So I hope this helps you answer now, let's take one now. All right, so now moving on. All right, so not surprisingly, based on the formula that we just wrote, right, is, the value of Q for a given reaction depends on the concentrations or the partial pressure of products and reactants. So for this reaction, based on what we just said, we can write down the QC as this. It's since this assume that I was, or as a chemist, the chemist collected the data for the concentration, and this is what I can write down for the QC values. Now let's try to understand what all these graphs are. Let's, let's see what's happening here. All right, so you have this reaction to sulfur dioxide reacting with oxygen to give you two sulfur trioxide, right? So this my concentration is in the y-axis, my time is in the x-axis. Since sulfur dioxide and oxygen are the reactants, that's why they have some concentration to start out with, right? But remember, at time equals to zero, we haven't formed any sulfur trioxide yet because that, that is my product. And that's why the concentration here is zero. Now let's see if I calculate the QC value. This is my formula, right? So at time t equals to zero, do you see how SO3 concentration is in the denominator? But look at this, SO3 is zero at this point. That means what should be my QC value be? Look at that my QC value is zero as well. Because my concentration of SO3 was zero. Zero divided by any number is zero. That's why QC equals to zero. All right, so I hope this made sense. All right, now as the reaction happens, remember, at the very beginning, let's say this is my round bottom flask. At the very beginning, at time equals to zero, all I have in there is my SO2 and my O2, right? Then as time goes by, as time increases, let's say time equals to one seconds, two seconds, then you're gonna start seeing some SO3 
pop up, right? Then over time, SO3 is gonna form. But remember the SO2 and O2, all of them do not disappear, right? So look at this concentration versus time graph here now. All right, and then finally, what's gonna happen is if you compare this graph with this graph. And again, do not worry about this graph. This is just the reverse process where sulfur trioxide was the reactant and then sulfur dioxide and oxygen was the product. So do not get confused. I'm just gonna cancel this middle one out so you don't get confused, all right? So for if I plot the reaction course in QC over time based on this graph. Based on this graph, what is gonna happen is like I told you at time equals to zero, since the concentration of SO3 is zero, the reaction course in QC is going to be zero as well because this is gonna be zero, zero divided by something, right? And over time, you're gonna start forming SO3, right? Over time, SO3 is going to start forming as as SO3 increases, the reaction quotient is going to start increasing as well. And there's going to be a time when equilibrium is reached right at this point. All right. And at that equilibrium, the concentration of SO3 is going to remain constant. The concentration of SO2 and O2 is going to remain constant. And that is why. Look at the value of reaction quotient Q it is going to stay constant as well. It does not change. <clears throat> now, that point right there, we're gonna start calling that the equilibrium constant K. So does that make sense as to when or where the Q becomes K, right? So think about Q, the reaction quotient becomes K, when the concentration of the reactant and product, they have stayed constant. All right, and the system has reached equilibrium. This is the point where we start talking about K. This is the point where we start talking about K. <coughs> right? So when Q remains constant, we use K to denote that and the formula for k is the same look at that so if you have this reaction a plus b going to c plus t with the coefficient as a b c d for small a small b small c d respectively for capital a capital b capital c and capital d i can write down the equilibrium constant k expression as this not surprisingly again remember this also tells you the relative amounts of reactant and product, but it tells you that information specifically when the system has reached equilibrium. If the system has not reached equilibrium, we are talking about the reaction quotient. Now the only way to kind of write down the equilibrium constant expression K. So again, remember now I'm gonna call start calling this capital K as equilibrium constant. All right. The other formula for equilibrium constant is this, where it basically if you know your rate constant in the forward reaction, and if you know your rate constant for the reverse reaction, if you divide these two numbers, you can also figure out the rate constant. So there are two ways to figure out the equilibrium, sorry, not rate constant, equilibrium constant. And again, do not get confused. Small k refers to the rate constant, whereas large k or capital K refers to equilibrium constant k. All right, so now let's look at this formula and let's see how does Alex asks you. How to use that? So the Alex gives you the reaction. It says hydrogen iodine decomposes to form a hydrogen and iodine. Right. So this is the reaction a chemist is looking at, and to decompose hydrogen iodide, 
gas to H2 and I2. Then the reaction starts happening, right? And at some point, what's going to happen is something like this. Right. So basically, what I'm telling you is, oh, the reaction has reached the equilibrium, right? And the reaction had reached equilibrium at a certain temperature, and we don't really care about that. And when the equilibrium has reached, it has given us the pressure of all these reactants and products. So these are the pressure of these reactants and products in ATM. Now it's asking us to find the value of equilibrium constant Kp. Now the way to do it is first you set up the equation for Kp. Right? Pressure of the product multiplied together. Pressure of hydrogen multiplied by pressure of iodine. These are my products divided by the pressure of my reactant. And I would say more like partial pressure because I'm just talking about pressure of hydrogen only. That's why you can use the term partial pressure here, right? And then am I forgetting something? Yes, because I do have to include the coefficient and raise to the power, right? So the only the one that I'm interested in is there's only two on hydrogen iodide. That's why the two goes here. Now all I have to do is plug in my numbers. Do I know my pressure of H2? Why not? 28.5 atm. And then I will talk about as to why K is unitless in a little bit. The pressure of iron is at 28.1 atm. And then the pressure of hydrogen iodide is 44.7. But then I have to square this. Right now, this is a lucky case, right? Yes, the ATM square is going to get cancelled, right? But remember, K, capital K, the equilibrium constant is unitless. Always keep that in mind. All right. So if I do my math here, this. I should end up with it's, it says round your answer to two sig fix so 0 0.40 and that's how you can use the equilibrium constant expression and figure out the equilibrium constant value when the partial pressures for the reactant and product are given but then something in mind, they must be at equilibrium. Because remember, anytime I'm talking about capital K, I am talking about the system at equilibrium, right? All right, now that you might be wondering, okay, you talked about Q, you talked about K, but is there a relation or not, right? Yes, there is a relation. The way to think about that relation is right here. This is a very good picture as to what happens when Q is less than K or Q is more than K, all right? So for this, what I wanted, I wanted to understand this number line as to what's happening here, this graph right here, and then this picture the important from exam two point of view. All right, so before that, uh, Let's try to solve this question because this is very similar to what we've been doing. All right, so asking is giving us the reaction. It's telling us when 0 0.10 mole energy is added to a 1.0 liter flask at 25 degrees Celsius, the concentration changes so that at equilibrium, look at that, they already gave me the concentration at equilibrium, right? It has been given, and then this has been given as well, the concentration equilibrium concentration of N2O4. And the first thing they're asking me is, what is the value of the reaction quotient before any reaction occurs? So before any reaction occurs, remember, if I write down the reaction quotient equation, it's going to look like this, right? Q equals to N2O4 concentration divided by Q. 
QC, right? Since I'm talking about concentration. Concentration of NO2 raised to the power 2. Now, before any reaction happens, keep this in mind. This hasn't formed yet. At time equals to 0, the N2O4 hasn't formed yet. So that's literally equals to 0, divided by concentration of NO2, which I don't really care about. 0 divided by this is 0. That means the value of reaction quotient before any reaction happens is 0. Now, to calculate the value of the equilibrium constant for the reaction, all we have to do is what I just did here, right? So instead of pressure, since this is talking about concentration, just plug in the values of the equilibrium concentrations. And if you do the math, what you should get is something like this, 164.06. All right, so now the first thing that I want you to do is, okay, in my early example, you calculate the KP value as 0 0.40. In this example, you calculate as 164.06. What am I supposed to get from that numbers, right? Because let's see if I tell you, oh, I drove my car to wheeling because I was speeding. I love speeding once in a while, all right? I didn't get pulled over as 80 miles per hour, right? And what you're going to think in your mind is, oh, okay, that means... In one hour, his car on average traveled 80 miles, right? That's what we're going to think. So, But then now the question is, okay, you solve for Q and K. What are you going to think? Like, how are you going to think as to what do those numbers mean? What do those numbers mean is this right here. It's really important. Really important from exam two point of view conceptually. So whenever you calculate K, Let's say you go ahead and calculate k. All right, what does this k value mean? And again, this is more like a kind of a good guideline as to think about it, right? So whenever the k value is really, really small, right, less than 10 to the power negative 3, right? So you're talking about, let's say you calculate the value of k and you got the value as, let's say, 0. 0.000. .000 one right is that number less than to the power negative three yes why not so what what does that number tell me is basically look at that that means in that reaction this is what's happening the reactants there are lots and lots of reactants the concentration of reactant is very high but look at the reaction concentration of product so less since the value of k is so small All right. Now, if you have a number between these two, 10 to the power 3 and 10 to the power negative 3, right? So some number might be, let's say, 10 to the power 3 is 10 times 10 is 100, 1,000, right? So let's say I got my value as, this is a really good example, as 164.06. What is that telling me? That is telling me, look at this, the concentration of reactant and the concentration of product, uh, they're almost in similar amount right so that's telling me that this example where the chemist worked through this reaction his amount of no2 is very very similar the concentration is very similar to n2o4 all right so let's say i ran a reaction and my value of k at equilibrium came to be as 1684 what this tells me is, oh, since the K value is very large, means that means I should have lots and lots of products. And as to why this is, remember, you whenever you wrote down the expression for a K, your concentration term was in the numerator, right? And your sorry, concentration term for the product was in the numerator, right? And that's why, since this is very very high. That's why you got the number as this as very, very high kind of concept. All right. Now, the next important thing I want you to learn from this graph. What is the most important? On the next important thing is, okay, now let's compare Q and K as to why happening. Again, very important this graph. Do not forget what does this mean. As to how we can compare Q and K, Q and K and Q, right? So, this graph 
should come to your mind whenever I'm talking about this. Because remember, whenever we're talking about K, Q, we're talking about the kind of the relative amount of reactant and product at any particular time in reaction, right? And over time, what's going to happen is Q is going to increase, 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 and at one point, the Q is going to hit where this Q will equals to capital K, right? The reaction quotient then will be called the equilibrium constant K, right? So look at this. This is what's happening, right? So let's say if the Q value is greater than K, or let's say, no, let's say Q value is less than K because that's the case. What is going to happen in my equilibrium system is, oh, if Q value is less than K, what's going to happen is the reaction is proceed to the right. Meaning, again, this is something that's really important, right? To understand what does this even mean whenever reaction proceeds to the right, a reaction proceeds to the left. Whenever the reactant proceeds to the right means, I'm going this way, right? And what I'm telling you is, I'm forming more and more of N2O4 or the product. Reaction proceeding to the right means, I'm forming more product. Or the concentration of the product is increasing. And that's what happens. Look at this. Right? Whenever the Q becomes less than K, all right, the concentration of product is going to increase and to a point when the Q becomes equals to K. Right? But then what about when Q is greater than K? So I'm talking about this scenario now. When Q is greater than K, what is going to happen is just the reverse. All right, the reaction is going to proceed to the left. The reaction is going to the proceed to the left. In this reaction, the reaction is going to the proceed to the left, meaning that more reactant is going to form. More reactant is going to form, and then at one point, what's going to happen is Q will equals to K after more reactants form. All right, so I hope the concept, what does reaction proceed to the right and then reaction proceeds to the left means, because this is a term that I'm going to use whenever I talk about Lee Sutler's, Lee Sutler's principle. All right, so this is something that I wanted to think about because I took some time and explained to you this small value of K, intermediate value of K, large value of K. So this is what I wanted to think about. All right, at least try to internalize this. Oh, this is what this means conceptually. All right, so this is your knowledge step two, and this is the same as very, very similar to this question. All right, nothing different. I just changed the concentration of NO2 and the concentration of N2O4 at equilibrium. That's the only thing I changed. And now I'm asking what is the value of the reaction quotient before any reaction occurs. I'm assuming that should be the same, right? Because as when the reaction occurs, right before any reaction occurs, the N2O4, which is my product, its concentration is going to be zero, right? And when that is zero, Q value has to be zero. The equilibrium constant K, I think you should be able to figure it out based on the formula that we just talked about. All right, so now this is where the Q and K is stuff and comparing Q and K is going to come into play. All right, remember what we had said was when Q is less than K, the reaction process to the right or more react more product is formed. When Q is greater than K, the reaction proceeds to the left, or more reaction is formed. All right, so this is what we're gonna see and use in this term, in this problem. 
right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to work through experiment one and for your knowledge check two or knowledge check three you'll have to work out for experiment three and again keep that in mind right so whenever i'm doing this try not to just copy me right what's the way i solve this understand it and whenever you are working through experiment three try to do it without looking at my video again right if you internalize this information the problem that I'm going to show you for how to work out experiment one question, you should be able to work it out for experiment three. All right. So now it's given us the starting concentration of reactants and products, not at equilibrium. This is really important because remember, whenever I'm talking about capital K, I am talking about the reaction at equilibrium. But this writer, whenever they told me starting concentration of reactants and products, they haven't reached equilibrium yet. Not at equilibrium. So whenever I'm talking about something that's not at equilibrium, I'm solving for Q, right? All right, so now the reaction that they're talking about this, and the good thing is they have given me the equilibrium constant for this reaction as well that's good so first thing that i'm going to do is i'm going to calculate my qc value All right so my qc since these are given in concentration that's why the soft skill qc equals to product and good thing about this reaction is there are no soft scripts makes my life a little bit easy product of the concentration of the products right or multiplication of the concentration of product divided by the multiplication of the concentration of the reactant now one thing that i haven't talked about here and that is going to show up a lot in the next probably two or three slides and in your lx homework is whenever you write qc and k expression qc kc qp kp something to keep in mind the liquids and solids state are never ever written down they are ignored we assume that the chemical activity of those liquids and solids are one that's why they do not affect the reaction quotient or the equilibrium constant k value that's why liquid and solid never show up in your equilibrium constant or reaction quotient expression Right, but then since all these are gas, that's why these are going to show up here. So I'm going to plug in my values. Remember, I'm doing my experiment number one. Concentration of CO2 has been given to me as 0 0.0040. And remember, QC similar to KC is unitless. So I'm just going to ignore my molarity concentration there, the F capital M. My concentration of H2 is 0 0.0040 divided by concentration of carbon monoxide, CO is 0 0.0203. And finally, concentration of water or gas, initial concentration is 0 0.0203. I do my math, I should end up with Q value as 0 0.0388. Now, why did I calculate? Q value because remember in this slide what we had said was when Q is less than K it proceeds to the right meaning that more products are formed when Q is greater than K it proceeds to the left meaning more reaction more reactants are formed right because the question has asked me what's this ask me determine in which direction the reaction proceeds as it goes to equilibrium now I look at my QC value and compare that to KC value. And I see that, oh, QC is less than KC. And when QC is less than KC, what did we say? Right? We go to the left, or the reaction proceeds to the left, meaning that more reactants are formed. Oh, sorry, sorry. QC is less than KC. Sorry, what's that? Okay, look at my. I just made a. When QC is less than KC, when QC is less than KC, it goes to the right, not to the left. Ah, goes to the right. 
when QC is less than KC, the reaction proceeds to the right. Since QC is less than KC right here, right? That's why the reaction proceeds to the right or more products are formed. When you start experiment one with these concentrations of CO, H2O, CO2, and H2. All right. Now your knowledge check three is basically same thing what I did, but for now you have to calculate the value of the reaction quotient first, right? Because you cannot figure the direction without calculating QC. Then determine the direction which the reaction proceeds as it goes to equilibrium experiment three. All right. So moving on. So this is what I was talking about, right? As to solid and liquid not taking part if you look at this equation you have pbcl to solid in equilibrium with pb2 plus aqueous and then two chloride anion aqueous right when i write my kc is the multiply the concentration of the products divided by the reactant but look at this since my reactant is a solid, right? This is a solid, and what I said is, if you have a solid or a liquid, we do not include those in our equilibrium constant expression. That's why forget about PBCl2, right? Uh, the example is here. You have ammonia, aqueous reacting with liquid water liquid since water is liquid here l that's why you do not see water here so cancel this out and that's how you came up with the equilibrium constant expression for this reaction all right so now i'm not surprised right? similar to what we talked about uh, about homogeneous catalyze catalyst a catalysis versus heterogeneous catalysis. It's the same term, right? Homogeneous equilibrium means all my reactants and products are in the single phase. So do you see how this is aqueous, aqueous, aqueous means these are all in liquid phase, right? My aqueous, liquid, aqueous, aqueous. These are all in liquid phase. That's why these two are the examples of homogeneous equilibrium. But if you look at my heterogeneous equilibrium, do you see how my reactant here is in solid phase whereas these two are in the liquid phase that's why this is an example of heterogeneous equilibrium and finally the take-home message from this slide is basically pure liquids and pure solids not included in equilibrium expressions and whenever i say pure liquid keep that in mind right so what does pure liquid means you might be wondering is an aqueous liquid and, and that's what he's i used the term earlier right for aq aq yes the aqueous is in liquid form but the difference between pure liquid and an aqueous solution is aqueous solution has solute or dissolved particles in it right so think about water right so let's say if you are drinking water from your tap do you think that water is pure liquid h2o only Pause the video and think about this for a second. The water, H2O, that comes out of your tap. Do you think this H2O that comes out of your tap is pure liquid only? No, right? The water that comes out of your tap has lots of dissolved particles, right? So let's say I have a water bottle in front of me right now. It's literally water, nothing else. It's just purified drinking water. But if I look at my ingredients, what's this? It says purified water calcium chloride sodium bicarbonate that tells me this is not pure liquid there are dissolved solute in it and that's true for your tap water as well you have lots of calcium hard water any ions that can like brings about hard water is in your tap water in there all right now whenever i use the term water liquid trust me this right here means liquid only only water h2o molecules nothing else and that's what pure liquid means
All right, so now, next thing. We talked about QP, QC, KP, and KC, right? And we said KP refers to the equilibrium constant whenever pressures of the reaction and pressure products are involved. KC, we use this expression whenever we have the concentrations of the reactant and product, right? Now the question is, is there the reason between those two or not? Why not, right? Because remember, C is the concentration, P is the pressure. Now look at this. We know that ideal gas flow tells us P equals to NRT, right? If I divide both sides by B, this is what I'm going to get. But isn't P is pressure? And isn't N by V, right? Number of moles per volume. What comes to your mind whenever I use that formula? Number of moles per unit volume. Isn't that the same as molarity formula, right? Because molarity formula that you learned in KM115, and you said, oh, no, molarity formula is number of moles, which is the small N there, divided by a volume of solution. Isn't that capital V there? Look at that. Right. That means we can relate the KP and KC as well. As to how we can do that, here is the process. I'm not going to go into it. This is a simple math, right? But if you go through the process, and the only thing that might throw you off, and I'm going to point it out to you there, all right, is basically when this they went from let's say here to here how did they go from here to here is basically what they did was they took this rt right and then bunched it together with this part of rt that's why you see that's happening and they put the concentration terms together, the RT terms together, they're able to do that. All right. So whenever they do all this, we do all this conversion, right? So what's going to happen is something called, we're going to get this new term called delta N. You're comfortable with capital R, right? Capital R is just the gas constant. And we usually use that at 0 0.082 liter atm per mole kelvin for this as well instead of 8.314 joules divided by mole kelvin all right but kc you're comfortable with this kc we're talking about concentration term equilibrium constant kp the pressure term equilibrium constant but what the heck is delta n t is the temperature sorry for what is delta n all right and do you see how for delta n They replace these terms for delta n. If you look at those terms, what do you think those terms are? Those are the sum of the coefficient of the product minus sum of the coefficient of the reactant. That's how you calculate the change in number of moles delta n. All right, so delta n equals to difference in number of moles. products and reactants. Now on the order then, remember in this slide I talked about as to how you cannot include the pure liquid and pure solids in the equilibrium constant expressions, right? It's the same thing here as well. For delta N, if you have a solid, you do not include those solids or if you have pure liquids when you calculate delta n, all right? And then finally, your formula is gonna look like this. This is how the equilibrium constant in terms of pressure is related to equilibrium constant in terms of concentration. All right, so I'll show you as to how the delta n is calculated. For example, let's say if you have this problem, if I ask you to calculate delta N, your delta N is going to be something like this. Right? Delta N is, like I told you, difference in the number of moles of products and reactants, or difference in the 
sum of the coefficients of products and reactants, right? So this is my product. It has a coefficient of one. So one minus solid is not counted out, right? So I cancel that carbon solid. And the sum of the coefficient in the reactant side, that means there's a coefficient of two in front of hydrogen, that's not. Y minus two equals to negative one. That means that's how change in number of moles delta n is found for any reaction. Right? For some of the reactions, the delta n can be equals to zero. And when delta n equals to zero, that means the number of moles of the gas or the aqueous species in the reactants and products, they are the same. All right. Now, Alex asked the same problem in a weird way. All right, so basically, it asked the same problem as to how I solved it here. All right, so I'm going to go through how Alex solves it, and I hope you understand as to how they do it. All right, so it gives me the reaction. It tells me now, now write an equation below that shows how to calculate Kc and Kp for this reaction. All right, so first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to do that, right? How do I get KC and KP for this reaction? For my KC, let me write whiteboard, but I think this is, I'm going to have less space for this. Remember, my delta n was negative one. All right, so now, okay, clear canvas. All right, so remember, the reaction that I was looking at was carbon solid reacting with 2H2 gas giving me, sorry, this is an equilibrium, keep that in mind. Right. Again, remember, this arrow is completely different from the equilibrium arrow. And the equilibrium arrow can even be used as this. These two are the same, though. So, I'm letting me change colors. Come on. That's right, right. So, these two are the same. But then this is completely different from these equilibrium errors. And I said that the n value that we calculated earlier was 1 minus 2 is negative 1. Right? So now, first of all, it's asking me to calculate Kc expression. My Kc expression is going to look like this. I'm talking about the concentration. That's why this big bracket. What I said earlier in the earlier slide is we do not include the solid and liquid terms in our equilibrium constant expression. My Kp term is going to look like this. Pressure of CH4 divided by pressure of H2. All right, and do not forget the square part right here. All right, so now, Question tells me that now write an equation below that shows how to calculate Kc from Kp. So they're telling me write an equation that shows how to calculate Kc from Kp. Now again, I'm going to do the same similar thing that I did in my slide here, right? The method that I used here, very, very similar. The way I'm going to do that is basically I know that my pressure equals P equals to NRT, that's my ideal gas law, that means my P equals to N divided by VRT. All right, so that means what I can do is, if I'm trying to calculate the pressure of CS4 here, my pressure of CS4 is going to look like n of cs4 divided by v of cs4 all right so i'm going to save my time and this is the same as the concentration of cs4 right now this part is making sense all i did was i used the idle gas law right and i'm writing this p term in terms of the pressure of 
methane CS4 because that's what I'm interested in, right? And then N dr by V is the concentration of methane. All right. Can I do the same thing for H2? Why not, right? So let's do the same thing for pressure of H2. Pressure of H2 is going to again look like concentration of H2 and RT. So I thought this one and two makes sense. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one and two and I'm going to plug in this equation. That means my now KP value is going to look like my pressure of HCS4 is going to look like CH4 concentration times RT divided by my pressure of H2 is going to be concentration of H2 times RT. But remember, this part is squared. Now I'm going to do like similar to what they did, right? I'm going to separate out the concentration terms and the RT terms. So separating out the concentration and RT terms, this is what I'm going to get, right? So I'm going to see it's for concentration divided by H2 whole square times RT divided by RT whole square. But look at this. Isn't this term the same as the KC value, right? So I'm going to substitute the KC value for this term. So that means my KP is going to look like KC times, now remember, my rule about exponent, right? So if you have x divided by x square, it's the same as x1 minus 2, right? Which is the same as x to the power negative 1, right? And isn't the same thing? This is rt to the power 1 divided by rt to the power 2 means this is the same as rt to the power negative 1, Right, so and that's the reason, right, between KP and KC. And let's go back and see if I had used my formula, would I have got the same answer or not, right? So my formula earlier slide it told me this KP. So let's just do my KP was equals to KC. RT to the power n, right? So let's look at this. Let's calculate the value of delta n. We said delta n was 1 minus 2 was negative 1. And look at that. Kp equals to Kc times RT to the power negative 1. Isn't it? And look at that. I got the same thing here. Can I get the same thing here? Look at that. Kp equals to Kc times RT to the power negative 1. And this is what Alex is asking you in that question. So I just want to show you we're able to fulfill this objective and move on. So that's why I'm solving this. I just solved this problem. Right, so here's a question. And this will ask you to put the two concepts that you learned together. And I'll give you some hint for this problem. So the first thing the question is asking you is value of Kc. Uh, all right. Now you can write down the equation for Kc, right? For this reaction, because this is the reaction we're looking at. And you might write Kc equals to Kcl5 is my product, no coefficient. So since this term about grams and liter that means the, the concentration divided by the concentration of cl2 and the pcl3 times the concentration of cl2 right now you are wondering but i do not have concentration but look at that and equilibrium mixture they have given me the volume of the flask right and the mass of this so i'm just going to show you one as to how to find the concentration of pcl5 right 
So you know that concentration of PCl5 equals to number of moles divided by volume, right? Do I know how to calculate the number of moles of PCl5? Why not? I've been given the mass. And I know the molar mass of PCL5 as 208.24 grams are in one mole, right? Because if I do that, I can figure, I just found out the, change the grams to moles of PCL5. There by volume has been given as 2.50 liters. Remember, the concentration of molarity, mixture with moles per liter, and that's it. If you find the concentration of PCL5, your answer will be uh, 2.0, I think it's nine or four. I mean, I don't really care. I think it's four or maybe nine. Okay, nine. And correct my math if I did this wrong, all right? It's not going to affect the answer that you have, trust me, on eCampus. So that means I found the concentration of PCL5, right? Do the same thing for PCL3, do the same thing for CL2. Then you can find the KC you answered part A. As to how to find the Kp, we know our formula Kp equals to Kc RT to the power change in the number of moles. Right? Now, do you know number of moles? Why not? Do you know R? Why not? Remember the R value here, you have to use the liter ATM for moles Kelvin unit. The reason being, do you see how this capital M is moles per liter? So we have to make sure that this matched up. And that's why we're going to use this. And the temperature, if it's not in Kelvin, make sure you change in Kelvin. Now for the delta N value, right? Delta N is, remember, the difference in the coefficients of the sum of the products minus sum of the coefficients of the reactant. That means going to be 1 minus 2 equals negative 1 for this as well. All right, so I hope this hint helps you answer A and B and helps you answer knowledge check for it. Look at this, even today is Monday. And then uh, you have about, I think, 11 or 12 questions for this week's knowledge check. So make sure at least start it today so you're able to do all these, at least four questions today, right? And you'll be done before it's midnight on Thursday. All right, do not wait until the last moment. I've been telling all the students trying to, Cramming everything at once doesn't work. It's like, let's say if I have a headache, right? And I just want to, you know, I'm just supposed to take like two ibuprofen. I'm like, oh, if I take 10, my headache is just gonna go in one second. No, it doesn't go away, all right? I just have to take the amount, all right? But then I just got to do it in a regular pattern so that it's not going to overwhelm me. I you don't want the ibuprofen to overwhelm your body because your body can only handle two ibuprofen of like 200 milligrams at one time. And it's the same thing with information, right? Do not leave, do not have that information overload trying to cram in everything on a Sunday, like on Alex homework, it's just going to frustrate you a lot, right? There will not be any learning. And that's true for even me or anyone who is trying to learn something. All right, moving on. I'm going to talk about the least artillery principle, and this is where I'm going to stop today. All right, so what is least least artillery principle? So basically, these are the learning objectives, and this is a kind of important concept. All right, <coughs> as to what does least artillery principle say? This is what it says. So when a chemical, so remember, we're talking about the, all the capital K, we're talking about equilibrium constant, right? We're talking about the system that was in equilibrium, and we have been denoting that by either this arrow or this arrow, to denote that the O, the reactants and the products are in a state of chemical equilibrium, all right? So, so let's say if a reaction is at equilibrium, Right, so that point where we talked about your, if you have concentration over time, this is your reactant, let's say, and then this is your product. Right, so do you see how at a time this concentration stays the same, right? And we said, oh, this is where they have reached equilibrium. All right, so let's say I have a reaction A plus B going to D, sorry, A going to just B. 
right where this was my a this is my b right at point zero b concentration is zero all right now and i said oh this is the part where they are reached equilibrium once it's reached equilibrium after you start using this arrow right so let's say after it's reached equilibrium i do something to disturb this reaction and I could do a lot of things, right, to disturb a reaction. Let's say this reaction was carried out at 25 degrees Celsius, right? Now to disturb the equilibrium, I can pump the temperature up, right? Why not? Well, I'm a scientist, I can do what I want, right? Just to see how it uh, reacts to my change in temperature, right? I could do lots of other things, right? I could literally add more A to it and see like, oh, here the cost, Concentration of A was constant after it reached equilibrium, right? But when I add more A, what did I do? I messed this equilibrium up, all right? Now, what does Lee Sadler's principle say is, oh, even though when I disturb this equilibrium, over time, what's going to happen? It returns to equilibrium by counteracting the disturbance. And we'll talk more about as to what are some of the different ways, all right? or conditions and then how the reaction counteracts these disturbances that I kind of briefly mentioned here. All right, so the way to think about though, let's, let's bring, our, bring our reaction quotient and K back, right? So we said that at equilibrium Q value equals to K value. All right, then I disturb the reaction. And I, I hope you can hear my <laughs> snapping of fingers. Oh, I can just do my beat. I feel like singing now <laughs> with the beat. All right, so anyways, let's get back to our disturbance, all right? So the reaction was at equilibrium, Q equals to K, then I did something to disturb it. So when I do that, what's going to happen is that disturbance is going to cause a change in the Q value. It's going to cause a change in the Q value, but guess what? the reaction will shift to recharge this such that the Q will again equals to K. And that's what Lee Sadler's principle says. Now, what are some of the conditions or factors that affect the equilibrium, right? Or how I can bring about the disturbance. And then once that disturbance is reached, what happens in the reaction to restart equilibrium? what I'm talking about. So there are the kind of four things that I can do to kind of try to disturb the equilibrium. All right, these are the four factors. The first factor is I can either add or remove the reactant or the product. Then we're going to see as to how does that change or reestablish the chemical equilibrium. What can I do with the temperature? Can I crank it up? Can I crank it down? Right? Does it matter if the reaction is exothermic or endothermic? All right, is something that I can mess around with. What about the catalyst? Because if for example, uh, for uh, reaction rate kinetics, we are said that, oh, catalyst, they speed up the reaction by lowering the activation energy. All right, now the question is, what does catalyst do to K? Does it affect K? Right? Or does it affect the equilibrium concentrations? So let's say if this was my concentration of A going to be. So does it affect that as all? So this is what we're talking about. Finally, pressure. Does the increase or decrease in pressure? How does that affect the uh, equilibrium? Sorry, my chuckle was because my cat is acting crazy here. It's just bouncing off. That's something and then something crazy. All right, so let's start with our factor number one. Adding or removing a reactant or product. All right, so let's look at this process. So let's say if I have, let me change the ink so that it's not all red. This is how ammonia gas is produced in industries. This is really important. One of these scientists called Heber Bosch, I hope I pronounced his name last name correctly. That's why this process is called Heber's process because ammonia is like used in a lot. Let's if you think about fertilizers and stuff, 
and ammonia is a very useful gas in all this to make fertilizers. So let's say this was my reaction. All right. So now let's say the reaction has reached equilibrium. And what we have said was as at equilibrium, this, con this concentration of NS3 is going to remain constant, H2, and N2 is also going to remain constant. All right. And I have this equilibrium constant K value. All right. So let's say I added more N2 in my first case, or I added a reactant. Now, what this says is the system will proceed in the direction that consumes part of the added species. Now, whenever I add more N2, what do you think is going to consume N2? Definitely H2, right? Because do you see how this H2 and N2 are on the reactant side? And then when that happens, when H2 consumes the added N2, guess what? I'm going to get more of this, right? And that's why my equilibrium will shift towards my product side. And this is how the equilibrium is reestablished. Right? So I hope the first bullet point kind of makes sense. And again, take some time to internalize as to what's happening. All right. So again, one more time. So I have this equilibrium reaction. I disturb the equilibrium by adding more nitrogen gas. Now this system counteracts by forming more NH3. And when you form more NH3, we say that the equilibrium shifts to the right. All right, so let's look at the another part when you are removing a reactant. Let's see if I remove N2, the nitrogen gas, now what's going to happen? Now it says that the system will proceed in the direction that restores part of the removed species. Now to restore part of the removed species, my reaction equilibrium shifts to the left or towards the reactant. That's what I mean by the second bullet point. And finally, whenever this is happening, remember the equilibrium is restored and then the Q becomes equals to K again. So I hope this adding or movement reacting to the product is making sense, especially these two both bullet points. All right, so now a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, since we said that pure liquid and solid are not written in the equilibrium constant expression, right? Kc or Kp, or even reaction quotient expression Qc or Kp. And that's why adding or removing a pure liquid or solid has no effect on the system. Unless you remove all the liquid or solid, that's a completely different story. But adding more or removing the liquid or solid from the system has no effect on the equilibrium or the direction of the equilibrium. And the reason that I just told you is because they do not appear in the equilibrium expression. And this is how Alex asks you. All right. So suppose you have this reaction, methane reacting with hydrogen sulfide gas, giving you carbon disulfide and then hydrogen gas. And then here they're talking about the Kp, right? Because since this question is asking about pressure, that's why they're talking about the pressure of CH2, H2. All right. All right. So now the first question they're asking is some CH2 is added. 
and that's the disturbance they are causing. That means they have added some of these carbon disulfide. So whenever you add that carbon disulfide, remember that's in the product side, right? So the way to reestablish the equilibrium is by forming more of the CS2. All right. So whenever you form more of the CS2, or if you form more of the product, what should happen to the pressure of this reactant? Sorry, I take that. Sorry, this is it's, it's added, not given out. Ah. Let me rephrase or. <laughs> Fix the mistake I made in the last two mistakes, last two minutes. All right, so let's backtrack. So, this is my reaction CS4 reacting with H2S, giving you CS2 and 4S2, right? And then it's the first condition that they have done is okay, this reaction is at equilibrium and they added more CS2. Now, remember, this CS2 is my product. Now, if you add more CS2, all right, that means two counter attack that disturbance what's going to happen is some of the cs2 is going to start reacting with 4s2 and guess what more of these reactants are formed that means my equilibrium direction will lie towards my reactant that means more cs4 will form more cs4 will form means the pressure of cs4 will go up right same thing with H2S, since this is in the reaction side, that means the, react, the pressure of that must go up as well. That means if you are forming more reactants, means the shift in equilibrium is to the left. And again, it's gonna take some time to kind of try to internalize this, take some time and then think about what is happening, All right? So I think about, um, one of the ways you can think about this, right, is I this might help you or not. I hope it does. So let's see if this is a seesaw, right? So this is my reactant side. This is my product side. So what it told me was some CS2 was added, right? So whenever someone some CS2 is added, it's going to look like this now. Right, this is my more CS2. So the first picture was at equilibrium. So this right here was at equilibrium. But now I disturbed it by adding more CS2, right? It's not balanced anymore. That means to counterbalance it, what should I do? Shouldn't I add something on this side? If I add something on this side, or if I form something on this side, one this balance out then then it's going to balance out right so you have this now this is going to balance out so think about this part as i'm forming more in the reactant side right that's why the pressure of cs4 and pressure of s2s goes up and then equilibrium is to the left all right some h2s is removed similar right you remove h2s means the equilibrium has to again go to the left because if you remove this what's going to happen this is literally again going to go like this right you remove one of these it's going to be like this and to balance that out i should add some more on this side of the seesaw right so when i do that means the equilibrium will shift to the left that means the pressure of CS4 and CS2 will both go up for both. So I'm going to talk about this factor really quick, and then I'm going to call it a day for today as to how does the temperature increase or how does it change the temperature. So one thing to keep in mind, right? So whenever you increase the temperature, remember you are adding heat. 
what I mean by that is, let's say if I have A plus B, going to C, if I say you increase the temperature, um, let's say this was the endothermic reaction, right? So endothermic reaction means you have to input heat, right? If you increase the temperature, it means you are literally adding more heat. Think about it that way. Because if we connect this, how does the change in temperature affect the, affect the equilibrium? If we think in terms of what we just talked about, adding reactant or removing reactant, we can connect this to this. All right, so keep this in mind. All right. All right, so let's see what happens to this temperature. So let's see if I have a reaction, same reaction. So let's assume this reaction is exothermic. Exothermic means delta H equals to negative. All right, that's my endothermic. Sorry, exothermic. Man, I've been making lots of mistakes today. Delta H equals to positive means change in enthalpy is positive means that is an endothermic reaction. Now, whenever it's an exothermic reaction, keep this in mind, the heat is released, right? The heat is released means I'm going to just write down the heat is the in the product side. Because remember, the product is more like a product. Think about that as product, right? That's why I wrote my heat in the product side. All right, so now <clears throat> let's see for the exothermic reaction, what happens if you increase the temperature? So if you increase the temperature, what's this? All right, so again, remember, try to connect this to the adding of reactant or adding of more product that we just talked about in these two slides, right? Adding more reactant or adding more product. Now, first thing is, I'm going to realize that, oh, okay, this reaction is exothermic, right? For what reaction is exothermic means, going from here to here is exothermic means heat is released. That's why I wrote my heat in my product side. If it was endothermic, I would have written my plus heat in the reactant side, right? So now, what happens when T increases? All right? When T increases, what we said earlier is it's the same as U adding the heat or you increasing the heat when t increases what did i do i added more heat didn't i but the way to think about this is basically think about this as you added more on the product side because heat is in the product side if you add more on the product side what happens? The equilibrium will shift to the left. Because what we had said was if you add more to the peroxide, it has to counterbalance by forming more of these reactants. All right, so again, think about this way. Whenever you form more reactant means the K value decreases. All right. Now, I use this term, K value decreases as T increases, but but for these conditions, whenever you're adding reactant, adding product, right? Adding CH2 or removing H2, remember, the equilibrium constant K does not change. But here, if you add heat, or if you, decrease the temperature or if we increase the temperature the k value does increase or decrease remember k value decreasing means in this case you are forming more reactant the concentration of reactants increases all right finally what is if the reaction is endothermic so let's assume this is my endothermic a plus 3b giving me 2c Right. If it's my endothermic reaction, the way I'm going to think about this in endothermic reaction is first thing is delta H is positive, meaning that I can say that the heat is added. Let me do it. 
it is added to the reactant side. And I'm going to treat this as one of my reactant now. All right, since it's an endothermic reaction. Now, what happens when you increase the temperature? When you increase the temperature means you're adding more heat, right? Isn't it? So this is the same as adding more reactant. So whenever you add more reactant, what happens? The equilibrium will shift more towards the product side, right? Meaning more product will form. More product will form means the K value will increase. Because in my K expression, remember my K expression, my product is in the numerator. So if more product is formed, means the K will increase as well. All right. So I'm going to stop here and we're going to talk about the next two factors and other uh, materials tomorrow. I hope you all have a good day. Enjoy the nice weather and all of you stay safe.